Josh Smetty. I'm Mike Golick. I'm Jessica Smetana. Welcome to another edition of Golick and Smetty. This is the NFL playoff and uh, college national championship edition. I'm Mike Golick Sr. She is Jess Smetana. And just a ton to talk about. College football is over. That is very sad. Uh, the NFL playoffs are getting ready to start. That makes us very happy. But I was very happy on Sunday. So Sunday, I was very fortunate to call the Buffalo at Miami Sunday night football game for Westwood One. Winner winning the division and loser still in the playoffs. Buffalo wins. They're the two seed. Miami loses. They get to go to Kansas City and don't have a healthy body anywhere. But that morning, you and your boyfriend, Lee, were so nice to drive up the 25 minutes from Miami to Fort Lauderdale, where I was staying, and not only grace me with your guys' presence to have a nice breakfast together, but you bought three Tupperware bins full of chocolate chip cookies, and she brought me a Notre Dame grandpa shirt, which was so thoughtful of you to do. And I can't wait to put that thing on. But uh, that was very, very cool. But uh, Jess came up and Lee came up. We had breakfast. We chatted. We shot the breeze for a little bit. And not going to lie, Jess, you gave me three bins of cookies. Two bins made it to the... (laughs) To the booth. They and these were big. You made good size. They were and, monsters. And and so there were about maybe four or so in a bin. And as I ate one and I closed it up and then ate another one and then put it on the, the, the bin on the floor so I couldn't reach it anymore. <laughs> and then said, Oh, screw it, ate another one and emptied one of the bins. So yeah, I took two bins with me. Everybody loves it because you put a hint. Is it sea salt or regular salt? Yeah. You put a hint. The, Everybody was just raving about the hint of salt you had in these massive chocolate chip cookies. It's the Malden salt. It's a nice little finishing touch. It's the flaky French sea salt that you sprinkle on top of them when they're still warm. Mike, uh, full disclosure, I texted you Saturday to see when you were arriving and if we were still on for right. breakfast. And you were on a really late flight, so you didn't respond till later. So I went to bed and was like, all right, I don't know if we're doing this. Like I haven't heard back. And then you texted me and I woke up, saw your text and I was like, oh, shit. I need to make some cookies. So those were fresh. Really? I baked them Sunday morning. Yes, I baked them Sunday morning. Um, new recipe, like have never tried that chocolate chip cookie recipe before. Didn't have one of the ingredients. So I did a little substitution. I'm so glad that they were good. I actually kept a couple here so I could try one like once they were you know, cooled down a little bit later in the day, but oh, what a relief when I tried one and and tasted it and realized, okay, this was, I'm glad this worked out because that could have been a disaster if I gave you inedible cookies. So what you're telling me is I was a guinea pig. Yeah, well, no, oh, because- no, I was, you tried a new recipe on me. You were changing <laughs> the whole scenario here. Well, I it was a new recipe from a very, very trusted source that I use for a lot of my new recipes. So I had a pretty high confidence level that it would work out, but I was nervous because this recipe called for corn syrup in the cookies and I didn't have corn syrup. So I used honey and it's a pretty good substitution because it's just, you know, it's sugar syrup basically, but you never know. So I was a little nervous, but I thought the flaky sea salt maybe would mask if some of the flavoring was off. But anyways, I'm glad it worked out and I'm I'm happy we came inside. I love them a little crunchy on the outside, a little more gooey toward the middle. I mean, chef's kiss. They were fantastic. Everybody in the booth, Loved it. It was interesting. Did Rico get one? Did Collinsworth get one? No. Oh, I didn't bring yeah. it to the TV, guys. This was all radio guys, man. <laughs> us radio packs stick together. Us and with us, you know, not in our coat and tie like right. the TV okay. crew. No, no. Yeah, they don't no. want to get crumbs That's exactly on right. Anyway. exactly right. exactly yeah. right. So I will uh, tell, give out to everybody. As I said, I said, come on up Sunday morning for breakfast. So we're in the hotel having breakfast. I ordered, you know, I think an omelet or whatever I ordered. Your boyfriend, Lee, ordered some nice. Oh, I ordered French toast, right? Thanks for remembering what I ordered. Your your boyfriend. It was a very specific order. You were like, no, no fruit, but I want whipped cream on it. Exactly right. So they're cornflake covered pancake, uh, um, French toast. That came uh-huh. with strawberries and some other kind of fruit. And Blueberries. as everybody knows, and you certainly know, I do not like fruit with my breakfast, whether it's regular fruit or a compote. So I said, just the plain French toast, of which why not dress it up a little bit? So I said, if you got some powdered sugar or some whipped cream, I will not be adverse to that. 
And I think I need to be more specific too, because they just put little dollops. I like yeah. enough whipped cream to when they bring the plate over, I don't want to see the French toast. <laughs> <laughs> it is completely like it's snowed on my French toast and you can't see it anymore. But I ordered that. Lee ordered a nice egg type breakfast with potatoes mm -hmm. and toast. Jess ordered bacon. <laughs> Just bring me a plate of bacon. It's all you had. They were it was delicious bacon. Honestly, my my only regret is not having like two or three orders of bacon because that's what I have be become accustomed to eating before we do the Levitard show. We normally get breakfast catering right. in the mornings and we'll get a huge thing of eggs, which like I don't want to eat eggs before a show when we're just going to be sitting there for like four and a half hours. Right. Like, I don't know. Egg, eggs are hit or miss for me, right. especially like catering eggs. They're yeah, not like yeah. a little fresh, different, you know, mass made. We yeah. have like usually we'll have like a thing of hash browns and then we'll have like a huge tray of bacon. So I've just kind of come gotten used to like eating a few pieces of bacon every morning. And I just I love bacon. It's a great breakfast. I don't need any. I don't need toast. I don't need eggs. I don't need anything else. Just give me a big slab of bacon. That's the perfect breakfast. Got to be crispy, though, too, right? Oh, super crispy. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. To where if you not know, like if you... not super oily. Right, either, right, right. That but crispy to yeah. like if you if you put your finger on it, it'll crack. You know, it'll, yes. it'll break. Oh my up. god, yes. Absolutely yeah. love that. So uh we digress, but we digress into something we love talking about bacon and cookies. So that hold was... on a second. Yeah. Mike, before we talk about football, Stu Gott said something interesting to me yesterday when we were in the makeup room at, at work, uh -huh. which was that you apparently told him that Christine Lisi was a better baker than me. I did not say that. See, that's Stu making things up. And Stu really gets makeup on? Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, every, every morning. I mean, he needs that his face to, was, like, wet for some that reason has yesterday. Take, when that has to take hours, chair. hours to do. By the way, as, as a quick aside, but I'm going to answer your question. When I first got to ESPN and it, it, the, we were HD, when we got makeup on just by, a like, a spray gun, like an airbrush. Oh my God. It was awful. Every morning I got, it was like, it was like the painter with the, with the spray yeah. brush on the house. I'd get my face just spray brushed and I, I hated it. And luckily that stopped after a while. But what I said about Christine Lisi, for those that don't know, Christine Lisi has been doing updates at ESPN forever. When I was doing Mike and Mike and me and Trey, and then my son were doing the show. What I said was, I said, they are both incredible bakers. I said, Christine does more different things like she'll make chocolate chip cookies with an oreo cookie baked inside of it that's mm -hmm. what i said i said she bakes they both are great she bakes things differently with how she's going to do it she it, it's more quirky than the the norm it's more quirky on the like i'm a more stuff. classic baker exactly she's right. more she, yeah she's more that's yes yes that's fair that's, ex I, that's exactly that's not what, what he said. said that's not what stugat said what? stugat said that you told him that and, and i guess i could go back and listen to the episode which i haven't yet because I, I was afraid it was going to hurt my feelings but i i took this with a grain of salt mike because it's stugat's and he lies about everything yes. but he he said that you said she was a better baker because she takes more risks. And I said, I've only ever baked cookies for Mike because they're usually traveling with me right, somewhere. Right. So I haven't really, that is, you know, he hasn't had the full. As, as you well know, and anybody knows who yeah. knows too, you can't believe him. He's just trying I to, don't believe he's him. just trying to start trouble. I said, I'm they are both that up. great bakers. Christine just does it differently than Jess does, which she does. You guys bake differently, but they're both fantastic. So let me what debunk that. Of I'm course gonna... he is. He's, he's still got you. You know, he made you buy into something that didn't happen. I'm going to punch him right in the throat when I see him at the Super Bowl. So <laughs> I'm going to call him out on the show. Do it. Absolutely do it. Back. Absolutely do it. Uh, all right. We can talk about football. Okay. Now. I'm glad so I got that off my chest. Now we have this national championship game uh, that took place on Monday night. And we're expecting this great game. I certainly picked the over, which was 55. You're expecting Michigan to run the ball well. You're expecting Washington to throw the ball well. And this probably high output of points. And we didn't get it. And while what we got, Jess, was a great Michigan defense. So we're going to talk about Penix being off, Michael Penix Jr., the quarterback for Washington. And he was off because even some wide open receivers, he was missing them. But this Michigan defense was fantastic. It turned into one of those games where Michigan was the better team. And you, at least for me, Jess, I kept hoping Washington could find their way back into the game. Like they made it 17 to 10 at the end of the half. And Washington was also getting the ball in the third quarter. And I thought, okay, 
Michigan's a better team. They just ran all over them in the first quarter uh, and basically the first half. Now Washington withstood that, is only down one score and gets the ball to start the second half. And then they promptly throw an interception in the second half. And you, it was one of those where instead of me thinking it was two kind of equal teams, I was hoping Washington could try and stay in it and then come up with a big play to make it more of a game. And it went the other way. Actually, I thought pretty disappointing for a national championship game. And and then it's not because like the teams played badly. Right, right. Michigan, I think Michigan's defense was oh. the reason mostly why Penix was looking off all night and why their offense was playing catch up. Um, because when you they were up by that huge lead in the first quarter, Mich- Washington's defense made great adjustments and were able to really limit what Michigan's run game and their pass game was able to do for the rest of the entire game. But I I mean, I was shocked watching Washington not able to mount any sort of comeback there. Like you said, I mean, it seemed like Washington going into the half, you know, like the the middle eight, they had an opportunity to change the momentum to get some easy points on the board and they got the ball after the half. And then promptly that interception was thrown, which was a, a really difficult pass into double coverage yeah. that you know Penix should have just thrown it away there and he just was off his game just it was it was pretty disappointing I thought and and led to like what I thought like maybe if they were able to score some points in the third quarter yeah. early on there would have been an exciting finish and instead it kind of just felt like you're waiting the entire fourth quarter for Michigan just to get one more score yeah. and for it just to be over yeah. mercifully over you, you, for Washington. You were exactly right because you were hoping Washington would do it. They didn't, they would punt. And then you were waiting for Michigan to put the nail in the coffin, which they eventually did off a long interception return that put them in position to just really ice, and, the, ice yeah. the games. I, it was the long pass to the tight end late in the game Loveland, that kind of set up. I mean, Colston final... Loveland, you know, because J.J. McCarthy, who, by the way, what did he finish? 26-1 and one as a starter, which is ridiculously good. Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. He only threw but the ball 18. Not a great no, stat line no. for this game. He was 10 of 18 <laughs> for like 140 yards, but it was that pass where it was kind of going back and forth, needing Washington to score. Is Michigan going to close the gate? And then he hits uh, Colston Loveland, the tight end, over the middle on a great pass, and Loveland goes for 41 yards, and that, all of a sudden, you started to go, oh. Because you're right. I, I've always said this. You got to throw the first couple of series out the window. It's kind of the period where you see what's happening and then you adjust. Now, for Michigan, on the plus side, they made hay with those first couple of, of series and had long runs for touchdowns. And all of a sudden, it was boom, boom, Washington's down big. But they did adjust. And actually, it took them a little longer to adjust than I thought it would. But still, uh, they did hold Michigan to just three points in the second quarter. So they were adjusting. So my thought was, okay, they, it was really tipped one way. Washington defense started playing battle and brought it closer back to level. So now it was like, okay, Washington offense, the side of the ball you're known for, here you go. Yeah. Get yourself back into the game. And I guess this is where, and, and it's an old adage that I think people don't believe as much anymore, but as a former defensive player, I do. Defense wins championships. Now, that solely is not the truth by any stretch of the imagination, but there is no doubt Michigan's defense, which was the best defense in college football, up against a Washington offense, which was one of the best, if not the best, offenses in college football. And that defense clearly, while Penix was off in some of his throws, for a lot of most of the game, this Michigan defense, they did the job. Absolutely. And I thought that when it seemed like Washington finally was, they had an explosive play to set up. I think they were within like the 30, this was early in the third quarter, um, got called back for a a hold, which was brutal. And then the next series, Michigan kind of gets away with one. And those kinds of things ultimately like don't really decide a game or, or I guess maybe it's hard to say whether they do or they don't, but we saw, you know, Michigan just being pretty dominant for most of the game anyway. So it's a little bit like, you know, water under the bridge at this point. But, you know, at halftime, I thought Washington was super yep. lucky to only be down by seven points. And if you were a Michigan fan, you were probably like, uh-oh, you know, the, something could change here going into the second half. Like they could rally and, and figure some things out on offense, make some adjustments. 
Um, and we only have 17 points to show for what was a really dominant first half. And they did not make any of those adjustments. And Michigan kept their foot on the gas, I thought. Um, although there were six punts in a row there in were. the second half of yes. the game, which was when I was starting to just kind of, all right, put put me out of my misery yeah. here. Someone just score something. So either, either make this a great game, game a close game, or a blow. <laughs> it's exactly right. It's exactly right. right. Do you think... Because people will say because of the the cheating scandal and that, that went on, and we know Harbaugh was suspended twice this year for two different things. Neither one, by the way, by the NCAA. One by the school self-imposing in the beginning of the year, and the second time by the Big Ten. The NCAA still not has chimed in on either the recruiting violation or the sign sealing situation. Do you look at this as a and and I can't ask my son Mike because he's so despises Michigan that I don't know if he can give me a true answer. Do you put an asterisk next to this because of what went on? Look, I think, I think the haters will put an asterisk next to it. And I don't think Michigan fans will care about it. I think that they won and they got the night and they got the celebration and the confetti and they're going to get the rings and the trophy and everything. Um, so they don't care about it, but yeah, I think that's something that everyone else in college football that despises Michigan will hang over their heads forever. And it'll just be one of those kind of unsolved situations. I, I know the NCAA will probably keep investigating yeah. and maybe they'll hand down a punishment in like three yeah. years. It won't matter. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter to Michigan fans. Right. It doesn't matter to Notre Dame fans that, you know, they got 30 games vacated in 2012 or whenever that was. Um, it just, it doesn't ultimately matter because they won the game on the field and we'll get to celebrate and, claim the championship so yeah it's just that's just kind of the nature of how these things go in college football there's no uh overarching governing body that can right. make any sort of quick decisions on what's fair and what's not fair and so here we are and jim harbaugh will potentially leave at the yeah. end of the season and it won't matter if there's a punishment for him because right. he'll probably be coaching the chargers <laughs> we'll, we'll use the verb now he might peak carol it uh, how Pete left yeah, USC right. as they were getting in trouble to go to Seattle. We'll get to that in, in a minute because I agree with you. I treat it like the uh, between Spygate and Deflategate with the Patriots. So what? You know what? You have. You know what? I still call them cheaters all the time, and that's my right as a as a fan. It, it is. Of it is your right, and and I can confidently say they're not the only ones cheating, but they got caught. And when you get caught, they didn't cheat good enough. Exactly. When you get caught, you have to pay the price for it. And I don't know what the price will be. The most it could be is you vacate the wins in the national championship where everybody would just laugh at that anyway, because that, that's an absolute joke. Um, to me, man, they were the best team and they were they were ridden hard a little bit for a horrible non-conference schedule. It didn't get tough till the end of the year. But you know what? They beat every team that they had to beat. I, I asked somebody this before, and I'll ask you. Do you think the Pac-12 will struggle more? Because just all the Pac-12, except for what, Stanford and Cal, which is going to the ACC, are going to the Big Ten. Do you think the Pac-12 will struggle more with the Big Ten teams and their style of play? Or the Big Ten teams mm -hmm. will struggle more with the Pac-12 and their style of play as they kind of intermingle now? That's a good question. And there's also the Big 12 teams that are going, like the Arizona, Arizona State. Um, I... I don't know. I think just looking at some of the schedules of the Big Ten teams, especially like obviously the divisions are going away next year, but like right. historically the Big Ten West has been pretty much like wide open right. and the last nine years has lost to the Big Ten East winner in the championship. So their schedules certainly are getting more difficult. Like I was looking at Penn State's schedule even the other day um, and just the amount of teams with winning records like the UCLA's and the USC's like those teams they were not close to being championship caliber this season but it's just going to make life a lot harder for some of these Big Ten teams that have really had to circle like you know your Michigan's and your Ohio State's every year so I think the level of play is definitely going to be um, more difficult and so I guess I would say the Big Ten teams are going to struggle with the Pac-12 right. teams what, answer your question what, more so than what, the what, reverse. Even though last night, you know, <laughs> the Pac-12 struggled a what, lot with, with the Big Ten, but with what Michigan but did. To your point, what, to, what I think it's really interesting, it's like Michigan, Ohio State, right? And every now and then you sprinkle in a Penn State, but they tend to be a bit overrated at times. But it's Michigan, Ohio State, right? In the Pac-12, Oregon, Washington, you know, you had some other teams, USC, kind of folded, but but. You wonder if the depth is better in the Pac-12. So you wonder where, after the the top echelon, 
Who struggles more, the mid part of the Pac-10 or the mid part of the Pac-12 when they come together? Does, right. You know, does, yeah. who, who was it? it was Maryland. Well, actually, Maryland had a losing record. I mean, you look at winning records in the conference, Iowa, Northwestern, Wisconsin. Where do they right. fit in right. when the Pac-12 comes in? It's going to be real interesting. Uh, and, and I guess now one of the big questions. So congrats to Michigan. You deserve it. I mean, it was and, and and they did it the old fashioned way. I remember Jim Harbaugh played for Bo Schembechler. Jim Harbaugh's dad, Jack, coached with Bo Schembechler, and they won a Michigan way, a Bo Schembechler way, uh, by running the ball. By the way, uh, Jim Harbaugh told the team he would get a tattoo if they won. And word is he's going to get one and he's going to get the M for Michigan. Which, by the way, has a du a double meaning, which I did not know because Jess, I hate Roman numerals, and I wish we would get rid of Roman <laughs> Roman numerals because I get confused when you have to put the ones before the bigger ones to drop it down a, a few. Yeah, I get confused. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. I did not know hard. Michigan has played or oh, has over a, a this a thousand wins, right? This is the year they went over a thousand wins. Oh. I did not know. That M is Roman numeral for 1,000. So yeah. Jim said it would be dual Michigan for obviously the M for Michigan and the fact that they were the team that got Michigan over 1,000 wins because they are the only college pro high school team to have over 1,000 wins, I believe. So that's what, that's what Jim Harbaugh is going to do. How about an M for making some random guy go to a ton of games to film the sideline so you could steal there signs? You go. And there it is. Those jokes, <laughs> those jokes will never get old. The, the, hey, exactly. The, I, whatever. The, I got one. The question, Jess, is will he take his M tattooed body and still be coaching a team with an M in it, or will he be going to the NFL? That's the big question now. Is so I guess right out of the gate, I'll ask you, do you think he's coaching Michigan next year or in the NFL next year? I'm trying to think of which NFL teams have an M in them with coaching vacancies right now. We've got the Falcons, ah, so no. Carolina, the Raiders, the Raiders, the Chargers, the Chargers. maybe the yeah, Patriots. No, we don't. None know. of them. None of them really Washington. have Washington. Yeah, none of them. None of them have an M. Commanders. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Maybe he'll coach the Commanders. Yeah, I I saw through the rumor mill his name most linked with the Chargers. I I don't know if that is something to take stock in. Um, it seems like everyone around like the college football apparatus thinks that he is leaving Michigan, and I can't think of a better time to go than right now, like you said, like to, to Pete Carroll it. Um, so yeah, I think if I had to bet on it, I would bet that he's leaving. It's interesting. Ward Manuel, the AD for Michigan ha has come out and said, listen, we, we deal with this every year, right? Last few years, he's been yeah, he interviewed sure. with Minnesota uh, <laughs> last year. So that's an M we, uh, there you go. We oh, would like him to coach. stay here, but we understand He's going to be wanted everywhere. Jim got Don Yee as an agent who is more prolifically known for the NFL. And I've always said this, Jess, and I think you would agree. Whenever you have a chance to swing the leverage hammer, you swing it as hard as you can because you don't know how many chances you're going to get. Remember, he didn't yeah. sign the contract. Oh, he didn't sign the contract extension in Michigan. So he is in line. If he's going to stay there, they're going to have to pony up. And if he wants to swing the leverage hammer to get the most money somewhere, more power to him. Will he go to the Chargers? Dean Spanos, not known for spending a ton of money. And you know, with the Raiders, they would. So I wonder if Mark Davis would try and money whip Harbaugh to get him to Vegas and coach Las Vegas. Because I agree, the best situation when a coach is looking for a job, he's going to look at ownership, certainly, what he's getting paid, but he's going to look at what, how the team is. And when you look at how the team is, you look at the quarterback, right? So you, you look at Vegas, you don't know, is Aiden O'Connell the answer? You look at Washington, mm -hmm. Sam Howell is not going to be the answer. You look at Atlanta, they went through two quarterbacks this year. We're not going to be sure who, if their quarterback's going to be. You know who the quarterback is in Carolina. It's a rookie coming off of a very rookie-like season. And you know the Chargers have Justin Herbert. So you know you could have, have some big-time yards on offense, and they need the defensive side of the ball picked. So that seems to be the most – you know, the job that you would want the most, that's most ready for you to go to and win, lest people may forget Jim Harbaugh has been the head coach of a Super Bowl uh, playing team with the 49ers when he played against his brother, John, uh, for Baltimore. So 
I do think he's gone as well. We were talking to Jason Fitz earlier, our, our old compatriot from ESPN. He said he thinks he's going back to Michigan. And believe me, if he goes back to Michigan, man, is he going to get paid a lot of money. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I guess, you know, nothing really would surprise me. I don't really know what, um, now that he's won a championship, maybe he'll take a few weeks. I don't know if he'll have that much time get, given how quickly the coaching carousel moves, but think about what what's important to him and what he really wants to do in his career. And maybe that changes now that you win a championship. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see, I guess. There's a lot of coaching hires and potential, you know, quarterbacks going to the draft things unfolding over the next few weeks. So we're, we're going to keep an eye on all of that, but where do you put JJ McCarthy in all of this after his performance last night? Do you think he'll go back to Michigan or do you think that maybe depends on if Harbaugh leaves or, or what do we do there? I don't see him as a first, I don't see it as a, as people talking about this first round quarterback. I, I don't see it at all. And maybe I'll be wrong about Michael Penix. I see that in Michael Penix. And, and a lot of people started jumping on the Penix bandwagon after the Sugar Bowl last week. But if he had been playing like that last week, he would have been the number one pick and won the Heisman. He has not. He has had games where he has been off. So he has not always been like he was in the Sugar Bowl, but I still like him. But he did himself no favors last night. Now, he got knocked around a lot, but he was off in some of his throws. And also, remember going to the next level, they tear apart all your injuries, and he had many injuries while he was at Indiana. So I'm not – the J.J. McCarthy, again, I think he throws well enough sometimes when you, when you need it, but he's not really relied on to throw the ball because he has such a great running attack. Uh, so – but we know just how teams will overvalue quarterbacks, especially if you need one. So – if there are two quarterbacks that are graded first round, four will probably go because someone will make a reach for one to say we can make him uh, this better quarterback. I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, that, that to me is going to be a very interesting thing. I, I thought it was interesting also what Harbaugh said to Scott Van Pelt after the game when, you know, you're going to ask him about, the, you know, what's coming up next. And Harbaugh said, well, I've already moved string, spring ball back a week or so because they played longer. You know, I've already told the coaches about. So it's like he was talking about spring ball at Michigan. But there's also reports of him trying to make see what kind of staff he would have if he goes to the NFL. So like I said, you got the leverage hammer, buddy. Swing it. Swing it for the 10-year, $15 million a year deal in college or some six-year, $20 million deal in, in the NFL. Who knows where it's going to go? But we're going to go next to the NFL. And the last week of the season was done. The playoffs are set. We have a bunch of teams that didn't make that made the playoffs last year that didn't and vice versa. So a lot to talk about in the NFL coming up next. All right, Jess, before we get to the NFL... Uh, the last game of the regular season was a game that, you know, I was in your neck of the woods and there was interest in, obviously, from, you know, the whole uh, uh, Levitard Metalar crew for Miami since the show is down there. Miami loses to Buffalo in that game. But one other thing that went on that night, and I've been out on them lately, and I don't think they're nearly as popular as they were. I'd have to look at ratings, but I, from what I hear, they're not. The Globes, the Golden Globes were, were Sunday night as well, right? Um they were. Yeah. So up against Sunday night football, good luck, by the way. I'm just not into them as much. So I, I don't imagine you saw it either if you're watching football. I was watching. Well, so for me, I had an interesting Sunday because the Steelers won on Saturday. You know, I'm a Steelers fan and I needed either right. Jacksonville to lose or the Bills to lose. But Jacksonville played early and they lost. So the Steelers were in right. for Sunday night football. So I was just watching to find out, you know, I knew that the Steelers couldn't play in Miami. They're either going to go to Kansas City or Buffalo. So I was watching to find out which kind of struggling AFC team the Steelers were going to play next weekend. But the stakes were still pretty high for Dolphins fans. And as someone who lives down here, obviously, I cheer against the Dolphins because it makes for, for better content. So, no, I kind of flipped on the Golden Globes for a second, saw that the guy doing the monologue was bombing, and then flipped back to Sunday Night Football. Saw he was bombing. The, the one great note I love out of it, Paul Giamatti, who I love as an actor, especially, you know, the, the series I watch, Billions, on Showtime. And he's uh -huh. been in so many other things. I love him. He won one for uh, the, the movie The Holdovers. Um, he took his, his globe, Jess, and went to eat at In-N-Out Burger. 
So he's at In-N-Out Burger uh, with his burger, hopefully fries. I don't know if he's an animal style guy or not, because I love <laughs> In-N-Out. And he had his globe right there on the table. How cool is that? I love that's exactly what I would yes. do because you know they're not served like the food at these award shows oh. cannot be it's probably like wedding food yeah, right yeah. like they're mass producing it I actually have been to an award show at the venue that the Golden Globes is at um, when I worked for Sports Illustrated and I cannot the, the food was not memorable so I'm I probably starving and I'm sure a greasy burger hits the spot oh. after you've been sitting there all night in your suit probably picking at some chicken thing plus it's great to probably not have to deal with you know all that those people of showbiz that you see all the time anyway <laughs> uh, get away from that uh but hey congrats to him uh congrats to, uh, i'm glad he went to the in and out burger and celebrated there but most of the country was watching football to see how the last regular season game was going to go and buffalo got that win miami lost and got more people hurt uh, I mean, Xavier Howard doesn't look like he's going to play. They got three linebackers that are out. Looks like they're going to get Mostert and Waddle back to go to Kansas City, where just Miami to Kansas City, where right now the expected temperature is anywhere from 16 degrees to minus two. So, you know, if there's any breeze or wind at all, it's going to be even colder. So good luck, Miami, in this one, huh? Yeah. And I also was, I mean, you can tell me because you were there. It sounded like the game at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami was like overwhelmingly Buffalo fans. Yes. That's brutal. I, I was stunned because I've seen it with the Raiders, especially when like the Packers yeah. travel well. Pittsburgh. I think I yeah. did a Pittsburgh game in Vegas, tons of Pittsburgh people. Same thing happens out in LA with the Rams and the Chargers. You know, that, that's such a tough place, I think, to have a football team, let alone two. Um, but I, I was a little surprised in my, well, maybe not so much. Cause I, 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 I've said this a, a, a bunch and it always ticks Mike Ryan off from the Levitard game <laughs> that when I played in Miami in 93, for a number of weeks, we had the best record in the NFL from nine and two on for a couple of weeks. And before that we had the best record and we were blacked out in the area because they would not sell out. They would not. Dan Marino is our quarterback. We're the best record in the NFL, and it couldn't sell out Joe Robbie Stadium. So it would get blacked out locally. So, and I came from Philly, where you know they're fanatics over there and, and yeah, selling out. They're booing you even when exactly you're right. Yeah. But, but at least they love you, love you or hate you. At least they're there, right? You know they're there. Yeah. So I've always had an issue uh, uh, with that. But give credit to Bills Mafia because a they were got the tickets right, and b they showed out. Because something good would happen for the Bills, and I and I haven't said it on the broadcast. It sounds like the cheering is like a hometown cheer. Uh, it was it was amazing. So they keep winning, and I go in on a high note to the playoffs. Miami uh, losing and just beat up all over the place. I, I guess looking at at the potential matchups to you, what are the most intriguing matchups from the Saturday, Sunday, Monday games? Uh, I'll cross both conferences or are we just doing AFC? No, because you can go either way you want. Because okay. I have two. I mean, I'm, I think Rams Lions is going to be, no matter what happens, I don't know if there's a lot of pressure on the Rams the way that I think there's a lot of pressure on the Lions this season. Although I guess you could argue like this isn't a make or break season for, for either team really, but right. just the quarterback matchup, I think in, in Detroit, uh, is going to be really, really interesting. It's the first home playoff game in Detroit in 30 years. Uh, and Matthew Stafford will be playing in it, but for the Rams. Um, that one is interesting. I think the Packers Cowboys, because you've got like the Mike McCarthy bowl is interesting. And it, you know, we know that Mike McCarthy is a good head coach, right? But we don't know, you know, he's won a Super Bowl. And yet, like the narrative around him is just that like he's wasted a lot of talent at quarterback right. in his tenure and that he can't finish these playoff games. Um, so that one is interesting. And I, I do think there is a ton of pressure on the Cowboys. They have to win. They have to beat the Packers. So I'm definitely interested in those two. Um, from the AFC standpoint, honestly, like I kind of am more excited for the next round of the playoffs to see who will get to match up against the Ravens because the lowest seed will go on to Baltimore. Right. So it, it could be the Steelers. It could be the Browns. It could be uh, the Dolphins. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. And that game I'm excited for because I think that is a 
pretty high pressure scenario for the Ravens who finally have, you know, the one seed to win a playoff game with Lamar Jackson and to make it to the AFC championship game. So that's what I'm looking forward to next weekend. This weekend, definitely Sunday, my my eyes will be on the 4.30 game and the 8 o'clock game. Well, I get to call that uh, Packer-Cowboy game, so I'm looking forward uh, to that one. And, and, and the pressure that's on the Cowboys, how much of it comes from their owner? Jerry Jones was asked after the game on Sunday about the job security of Mike McCarthy. And instead of saying, we won the division, we're in the playoffs, let's, you know, let's ride, let's do this, he said, well, that'll depend you know, game by game in the postseason. I mean, my God, I mean, but I guess I kind of get it. I guess it's Jerry Jones, you know, <laughs> and and by the way, I've seen this happen. This And it was to my brother, actually, when he was in Cleveland, Marty Schottenheimer, God rest his soul, went to a couple of AFC championship games and lost to Denver, the drive, the fumble and such, and eventually was fired because he couldn't get over that hump. You know, Andy Reid, when he was in Philly, went to how many NFC championship games and won Super Bowl and lost. Uh, he went to one Super Bowl and lost there, and that, that was played in Jacksonville. And he gets fired. It's like, my God, you know, you're so close in winning, but they're even waiting for Mike McCarthy to get close to that. But that just sounded wild for a guy, for a team who won their division and had been playing certainly well at times to be saying, yeah, we'll take a game by game in the postseason. So, I am looking forward to that one because Jordan Love led Packers six and two in their last eight. They're playing well. Yeah. Their defense worries me a little bit. So I'm going to have fun breaking down this game and calling this game. I agree with you about the Rams and the Lions. The storyline there is one of the best in the first round, especially for Detroit and Dan Campbell bringing this team, which has always been, you know, bag over your head, laughing stock team to where they are now to the swapping of quarterbacks and two offenses that have nice, deep offenses. I always talk about the offense of the 49ers, how deep it is with McCaffrey and Ayuk and, and Debo Samuel and Kittle, mm -hmm. you know, but both these teams have deep um, um, offensive weapons as well. So wouldn't shock me if the Rams went to Detroit and won this game. I think if yeah. nobody has a horse in the race, they're going to be rooting for the Lions because I think people love Dan Campbell and my God, the Lions haven't done squat in how long and now to have a chance to move on. In the AFC, there is a game that intrigues me, Jess, and it's the Browns and the Texans. Because these are two teams, I think this game has the coach of the year on it. I think it should be Kevin Stefanski for having 11 wins with four quarterbacks. Yeah, four quarterbacks. That's true. And you lost one of the best running backs early in the season in Nick Chubb. And yeah. also, if he doesn't win it, it's probably going to be D'Amico Ryans, right, from the Texans. He, they are early. Understand they have a rookie head coach. They have a rookie quarterback who played incredibly well. They also have a rookie edge rusher in Will Anderson who had seven sacks and could get will get votes for defensive rookie of the year. And, oh, by the way, Bobby Slowick, the old coordinator, is a first-time play caller. So that blows my mind. Now. They're not in the toughest division known to mankind, but still, they're, they, they've come early to the party of what they're trying to build. And uh, so much uh, uh, congrats to them for it and to the Browns for four quarterbacks. So I'm almost bummed one of those teams has to lose now, you know, and, and move on because they're two great stories this year. I think I'm I'm partial to if we're, if we're arguing about like coach of the year uh, to D'Amico Ryan's for the job he's done in Houston, just because I think that like their skill position players co coming into the season, like I, I probably couldn't even tell you who would be receiving these these amazing passes from C.J. Stroud. And, and, and like we talked about early in the season, like C.J. Stroud. Um, you know, we thought like he'd be a good NFL quarterback, but it's a really tough ask to come in your rookie season with a roster right, like this right. and be asked to win games, let alone be in the playoffs and potentially win a playoff game. So I'm with you. I think if, if Houston wins, he should absolutely be the coach of the year and CJ Stroud should be the rookie of the year uh, because what they've done in Houston has been pretty remarkable. So I'm, I'm excited for that one too. You're right. That, that will be a good game. It feels right to have the Texans playing in that early Saturday slot. It just feels like the official start of the NFL playoffs when you turn on your TV Saturday afternoon and Houston is playing uh, a home game in the playoffs. I think the last game is the most head scratching game 
right? Monday night, it's the Eagles at Tampa Bay. Because yeah. with Tampa Bay, I mean, as a former player, and I'm sure as an offense, especially O-line, people love Baker Mayfield. You love his competitive spirit. The dude is like a train wreck, right? Uh, yeah. a, his ceiling probably isn't very high, but he led this team, Tom brady less team, to, you know, the division title. I'll say again. He'll play his guts out. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and I'll say again, just like the AFC South, not the most competitive division, the NFC South in the world, but still, this dude will drop a shoulder before he slides. He will take a hit. He will go make a tackle, and t teammates love that. To a team in the Eagles, just I don't know who the hell they are anymore. I mean, I know they had injuries at linebacker and DB, but even when they started getting healthy there, they just weren't playing well. I, I, I can't figure them out for all the talent that they have. I thought – Wow, they're actually might be in a in a great position to play, um, to to have to play Tampa Bay right by being the number two seed in this than a hot Packers team uh, with with Jordan Love. But man, I don't know. I could see the pack uh, the the Buccaneers pulling this off unless the the Eagles can get their head out of there. You know what? Yeah, that would be a pretty wild. And you say like it's a bad division, but like three other teams lost. So there, it's not, you know, like you still won your division, even if it was crappy. You didn't like you didn't have to do that. The other crappy teams didn't do it. Um, I'm curious, speaking of the NFC South, what you thought of the debacle at the end of the Saints Falcons game, because that was uh, not not a fun one. So for those that if you didn't see it, it's wild. Uh, coming to the end of the game, Teron Matthew, Matthew had an interception for the Saints. He ran it back to the one-yard line, uh, right at the one-yard line to, to, to score again. Um, and uh, or, or, yeah, for the Saints against Atlanta. And they could have taken a knee, and they were in victory formation, run the clock out. Right. Jamal Williams, Jameis Winston was the quarterback, went in and was told it was victory formation and kneel mm -hmm. down, the game was over. Jamal Williams was also on the field. Jamal Williams, for those that may not know, last year with Detroit, led the league in touchdowns and rushing touchdowns. This year he has none. So he was in the backfield, and Jameis even said when they went out there, he basically asked everybody, hey, let's run a play off this and, and let Jamal get a touchdown. Everybody agreed. So they were in victory formation. The defense saw they were in victory formation, though you heard some of the defensive players say we – Usually you brother-in-law there, you ask, you guys kneeling down. He said, they said nobody on the offense answered the question. So they thought something might be up. Sure enough, they ran it. They scored. Jamal Williams got the touchdown. Arthur Smith, you know, F-bombed his way over to Dennis Allen, you know, cussing him out. Arthur Smith eventually lost his job, not because of that play, but because of the, the season they had or last couple seasons. Um, to answer your question, Jess, it was a Bush League play. Uh, you 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 can't you can't do that. You want him to score, line up in an offensive formation, and yeah. run a play. That way, that's where I'm. That at way, too. the defense is like, okay, if we don't stop him, it's our own fault. But just like offenses get ticked off at a D line in a victory formation when the D line comes off the ball hard and they get ticked at him because uh, that that shouldn't happen. The same way, the other way to run a play off that is absolute bush league. So. And, and and Jameis, it's not like he could change the call, right? And put them in a normal situation. If he put them in a normal formation just to run a play, Dennis Allen would have called timeout. He would have called timeout. But in the victory formation, Dennis Allen had no clue they were going to actually run a play. And they did. Right. They scored. Now, I disagree with some of the, you know, the, the loud yelling shows out there that said <laughs> Jameis Win uh, Winston should be cut immediately and Dennis Allen should be fired immediately because Jameis, yeah. they think the quote was Jameis Winston's a loser and brings the team down and Dennis Allen has lost control of that team because they defied him. That's ridiculous. That's going too far uh, without question. Uh, I, I certainly a bit of an over. Yeah. Yeah. A bit of an over, but you know, that's where we are today and some things, but that's okay. If that, that's the way you want to go, no problem. So yes, it was a Bush league play. I'm not calling for anybody being cut or fired because of it. Um, at all players look at the, the micro jest. They looked at it as getting Jamal Williams, a touchdown as I think it was Jimmy Graham, a tight end for them said, we didn't really think of the fallout while a coach thinks of the macro, because as soon as they did that and they scored, Dennis Allen had to be going, 
oh my God, I'm going to have to talk about this. And Dennis yeah. Allen was walking toward Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith is MFing him like crazy. And, and just Dennis Allen had to eat it. He had to just yeah. stay there and say, thank you, sir. May I have another? I know. I know. Sorry. Sorry. You know, I mean, what could he do? I, I can't even imagine that scoring that touchdown even feels that know, good, right? I like know. scoring a touchdown out of victory formation can't, Yeah, I get it. I mean, but still that whole thing was such a mess. Oh, I'm with you awful. though, that it was a great, uh, entertaining way to finish Arthur Smith's uh, yeah, career yeah. in Atlanta, his final, his final moment as a head coach on the field, just swearing at their division rival because of some stupid garbage time touchdown that didn't even matter really uh man what a dumpster fire i i don't know who they're going to hire yeah. next and what they're going to do at quarterback but that is something that um i will definitely be keeping an eye on in this offseason because this has been a bummer of a season for them. that's why you're going to get you're probably going to get more of the, the, the coordinators now taking some of these jobs because some of these teams don't have quarterbacks right they're not going to have quarterbacks you know of, of vegas is aiden o'connell your quarterback you know Bryce Young is. Sam Howell is not going to be it in Washington. You know Herbert is, though, uh, in, in the Chargers. So it is going to be interesting. So before we get to one last thing I wanted to chat about, let's quickly, because next time we do a show, these playoff games will be over. So outside of me not picking Packers and Cowboys, let's go through them quick. Texans, Browns, who do you like? Browns, I think. Yeah, I think I do too. I think I'm a lean there. The Texans a great story, but again, the Browns a great story as well with elite Joe yeah. Flacco leading the way, but I'm going to lead toward the Browns mainly because of their defense. Dolphins travel to the Chiefs where it's going to be frigidly cold. <laughs> I think Chiefs, but it, this might be an, an ugly one to watch. Boy, it really might. And, and again, the Dolphins, I mean, Waddle is coming back. Mostert's coming back. Three linebackers are out. Plus, Avian Howard, the, the DB, he's going to be out again. He missed the game against think, Buffalo. Yeah, Ch the Chiefs defense, I think, will will win them yeah. a couple postseason games. But I would probably take Chiefs in the under. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I I would agree there. We're 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 in line right now. Uh, Sunday first game is Bills Steelers. Are you going to try and go with your team? I Bills are playing really well now. T.J. Watt, I don't think there's any way he's going to be yeah. playing. You're still playing with a backup quarterback. I'm going with the Bills here. I'm going with the Bills, but with the caveat that this might this might be a really stupid game. This one might get dumb. There might be some arm punts. There might be some Josh Allen silliness. And and weather won't affect it because Pittsburgh's used to bad weather uh, as well. Packers, Cowboys, I can't pick. So who do you like in this game? Uh, I like the Cowboys. You like the Cowboys? I'm gonna take the, yeah, I'm going to take the easy. Probably. Easy road there. That's going to – the Cowboys offense with CeeDee Lamb, who's incredible, against the Packers defense at a struggle will be an interesting matchup. Rams-Lions, what a, what a matchup here. Rams going to Detroit. I'm taking the upset. I'm going to go with the Rams. You are. I, I'm, I might be more with my heart because, again, I don't have a horse in this race, but Detroit's been down for so long and – and I, I'm a big Dan Campbell fan. Not to say I don't like Sean McVay, but just how he's turning that program around. But the Rams are playing well now. It's tough for me not to lean toward them, but I'm still going to go Detroit. And then finishing up Monday night in Tampa, Philly coming to town. I'm going to say that Philly is able to find their selves, themselves a little bit, at least in this game, and go on the road and win in Tampa Bay. I say Philly wins, but the fans, Philly fans are going to be really angry about it one way or another. And then all these as they have been all season. <laughs> all, all these teams that are traveling just are we hoping they don't fly Alaskan Airlines? I mean, all Oof. of a sudden a guy is showing us the, the 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 piece of equipment that fell into his backyard when what the door yeah. blew off of the thing. I mean, what what a horrid situation that was. Mike, I could talk about this for hours, but know that I looked up what aircraft my flight to Las Vegas yeah. was a few a few days ago because this was a, a terrifying thing that I had to think about all weekend so isn't that brutal that when you know you have to fly because didn't United go through something with bolts or something like yes, that or yes, I mean well so the entire fleet of these plane this type of plane has now been grounded and they're doing inspections and United has I think the majority of this type of plane the Boeing Max 9 uh plane so they found some loose bolts doesn't really leave much to, um, you know, make people feel better or make travelers feel better about upcoming flights. So that's great. Well, Jess, maybe the train comes back into play, a nice way to travel. Would, and yes, if you travel by train, trains. the way I look at it, you and I could sit there and eat all your baked goods. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Let's bring back trains 2024. <laughs>